I'm um, bringing up on stage my backpack of faith. And I have put some items in this backpack that I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes, if it doesn't fall off. But before we get started, I think you ought to have a backpack of faith as well. So take a look inside. What's in them? Nothing. They're designed to be filled with something. We're starting a new sermon series this morning called A Day with God. And I kind of took it off of a, a television series that's no longer uh, uh, on the air anymore. There was, a, there was a, te a television show called 24. And it spent a day with an anti-terrorist organization, a, a government organization, protecting us from terrorists. And so there'd be a threat, t typically, and then you'd spend that 24 hours with them as they solve the, the, the threat. So each week was another hour. Uh, I'm only going to do three this, uh, this week, okay? It, I mean three uh, sermon series uh, in this uh, sermon series. The morning hour, when you leave home hour, and you say, well, I'm retired, I don't leave home much. I'm finding out from Coy, he leaves home a lot. <laughs> and then you got the evening hours. And so this morning, in my, in my backpack of faith, I'm going to share some things with you about the morning hours. So we're going to start this morning with the, the morning hours. But before we do that, there are some of you in here this morning who are morning people. You get up at 6 o'clock. Some of you get up at 5 o'clock. Some of you get up at 4 o'clock. Some of you get up to see the sunrise. I'd rather watch the sun set, but that's beside the point. But some of you are morning people. You wake up, you get ready to go, you start your day, you, you, get, you start your to-do list, you're perky. In fact, you're so perky, you're on, the fir you're on a first name basis with the paper boy. Or the paper man, or the paper girl, I don't know. Maybe you don't take the paper. But you're the, that dog walker who gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning. You know his name. And uh, uh, not me. I, I, I'm not that way. But you get up and you go and, and you're ready to hit, hit the ground running. Now, how many of you here are evening people, night people? Anybody night, night people? I'm a night person. Yeah, we don't know the paper boy's name. That's why we don't have the paper. Um, you know, uh, it, my day doesn't start until the sun is at least up for a while. It's just, that's just the way I am. And if I, if I get up early, I have to be in bed between 10 and 11. If I stay up past 11, I can't sleep till about 1 or 2 in the morning. That's just the way God made me. Some of, you, some, some, some of you are very perky in the morning. I tend to be a little bit more perky at night. That's just, just the way God, God built me. And God has built you that way. Some of you wake up saying, Good morning, Lord. And the rest of us keep wake up saying, Good Lord, it's morning. And that's just... A, and I'm also, going to have, I'm also making some assumptions this morning. There are some of you here today who really want a deep and vibrant and connected and committed relationship with God. That's one of my assumptions. You know what happens when you assume though, okay? Then there's some of you here today who experienced, who experiences an occasional dry spell in your spiritual life. And there may be some of you here today who don't have a relationship with God. You're curious, you wonder, you're very interested in connecting with God. The ser these series of sermons are going to help you do, it, whatever category you fit in, it's going to help you with that. So I'm going to, I'm going to speak from, from the first person, and when you hear me say, I do this, understand it may not be at 5 o'clock in the morning that I do these things, all right? But we're going to cover a 24-hour period with God. Okay, and we're starting with the morning hours. So, how do you start your morning? How do I start my morning? So I go into my little backpack of faith, and I pull out a megaphone. So I can shout. 
This little plastic thing really does a pretty good job of amplifying my voice, doesn't it? Shout. Shout it. Words of wisdom. When you wake up, shout it. Words of wisdom. The megaphone reminds me that I need to shout when I get up. Now, if you are a morning person and you are married to a nighttime person, you may want to shout internally. All right? Unless you really want to scare somebody. So, you can start your day, or I start my day, when I wake up, and this is typical nighttime per pe persons, not so much morning people, I wake up and I lie still in bed. Just lie still. Now, if you're a morning person, that's hard to do, to lie still. And, but, but I'm thinking that most of you can, when you wake up, can at least lie still for a moment. You can do that, right? It may be difficult, but that's something you can do. It's, it's kind of the discipline of learning to be still before God. And like I said, for morning people, that may be difficult. Because I think, I think, I'm not a morning person, okay, so please excuse me for generalizing. I think most morning people want to get up and hit the floor running. I'm looking, and some morning people are going like this. Some, some nighttime people are going. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you want, to you want to jump out of bed, you want to get your, you want to get your to-do list going. But it's all about being still, just for a moment, to begin your day with words of worship. Words that acknowledge God's awesomeness. Words that acknowledge your dependence on his role in your life. Words of gratefulness for his unconditional love that he has for you and me. So the word shout communicates passion. Please hear me, folks. Listen, the word shout communicates passion. I'm not literally saying that you should worship and, and scare the person next to you in the morning. That's not what I'm saying. It's an attitude of passion. When you go to a pep rally, everybody's shouting because they're very emotional. <coughs> they're very passionate. So shout praise from the ins from shout shout your praise from the inside. Condition yourself to almost explode with praise and thanksgiving for who God is. In fact, he's given us a day to be alive. He given, he's given us another day to love and to minister and to share and reflect on Jesus. Now for you non-mourning people, it may be easy to sit there and lie still. It's another thing to generate some passion for God in the morning because we have a tendency to lay still and fall back to sleep. That's just what nighttime people do. But we need to condition ourselves that in the morning, we need to take time to be still and know that God is God. Because, but, but if you're like me, when you do get up, you're probably looking for that well of coffee. If you do get up, you don't have words of passion because when you get up, you sound like Chewbacca in the morning. Not 3CPO, three, three but Chewbacca. <laughs> Sometimes Gina's grandmother is awake and setting up when I get up and she goes, Good morning, John. Yeah, whatever. I try to, I try to, good morning. <laughs> right? I'm not. <coughs> it takes time for me to warm up. But my first thought needs to be I'm sorry, when I get up in the morning, my first thought, unfortunately, is not always on God. My first thought is the bathroom. That's, but you can use that thought. 
Did you know that? You can use that thought. I don't get it. You could use that thought to trigger words like, Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you, God, I can get up and go to the bathroom. I'm alive. I can live for you. I can use that thought to praise you, God. I can use that thought to, to, to remember that he loves me. I can use that thought to say good morning to God. I want to worship you. I can use that thought to say, God, I dedicate this day to you. You can use whatever triggers you in the morning to start shouting praise and worshiping. But why words of worship? Why words of worship? Words of worship immediately puts, I don't know about you, puts me in the mood of recognizing God's presence. In fact, that's what worship is. If you have come to sing songs just because you like to sing songs and you miss God, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with that. We ought to walk in and fellowship together and then recognize that we're in God's presence. And because we're in God's presence, that should trigger us to worship. And in the morning, you may not, I really don't feel like, we're, and particularly nighttime people, I really don't feel like worshiping. I got to get a couple of cups of coffee in me beforehand. Well, use those to trigger things to start thinking about God. And you morning people, as soon as your feet, feet hit, hits the floor, that's a time to say, wait a minute, maybe I need to think about God instead of myself and my to-do list. Maybe it's time I need to dedicate this day to God. See, it works both ways, whether you're a nighttime person or a morning person. We all have to deal with the morning. Words of worship puts me in, in the, mood, uh, the mode of recognizing God's presence. Deuteronomy 4.39, so remember this and keep it firmly in mind. The Lord is God both in heaven and on earth, and there is no other God. Instead of positive thinking, this world is filled with positive thinking. How's that working out for the world? Seriously, how's that really working out? Instead of using positive thinking, how about having an attitude about living for God today? Would that change things in our lives? If we all did that? If we woke up in the morning, regardless what time you wake up in the morning, Maybe earlier, maybe later. It's about recognizing who God is and being with, in step with Him as soon as you get out of bed. This makes us better people. This makes us better parents. This makes us better spouses. This makes us better kids. Just that, they just make us better. It turns my heart towards humility and gratefulness. Out in the world, I will find just the opposite of that. We'll find selfishness and arrogance. But how in the morning, if you're a Chewbacca in the morning, if, how can I shout words of worship in the morning? If you are a morning person, you're looking for something more practical. And that's okay. I've got some practicality for you. Let's just, let's, just, let's just go and be practical. How difficult is it to find three by five cards at Walmart? Anybody go down to the office area, the stationary area, the school area, school supply area, particularly as, as August comes, three by five cards, maybe a buck fifty, a couple dollars. Get some three by five cards and begin to read the Psalms and write on those cards, Psalms of Praise. Write down verses that are words of worship. For example, I gave you an example in your bulletin. On one card you could put this, Psalm 118.24. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, what are some more? Where do I start? Psalms 66.4, Psalms 138.2, Psalms. That's in your bulletin. You don't even have to write that down. Just take your bulletin home. 
And then get some three by five cards and start writing. Practicality. That's practical. Obviously, you may wake up and not feel like doing that today. Or you may wake up and, man, this is, this, I gotta do this every day? <laughs> this is something I gotta do every day? Listen, you won't be alone in thinking that. But do it anyway. Because oftentimes, when we don't feel like doing something, our action changes our feeling. Our actions sometimes changes our feeling. Sometimes you have to start doing things and it changes the feelings that you have. There was a time when I did youth ministry. I got to the point where I wasn't too sure I want to do another lock-in. Now at 63, I don't think I want to do any more lock-ins. At all. My idea of, of the ball dropping is to see if I can get a, a, a feed in New York at 10 o'clock so I can be in bed by 10.30 on uh, New Year's. Well, I thought you were a morning person. Or, uh, I thought you were a nighttime person. I am. But I'm bringing back practical. If, if I get up, if I, if I stay up past 11, I'm going to be up till about 1.30 and she's going to get up at 5. When she gets up, I can't stay in bed any longer. So... It just benefits me if I can go to bed earlier because I know that she's going to get up early. But that's something we can do. Sometimes we just don't feel like it. But when, I, when, I didn't, when we got started doing the lock-in, I got into it. I was always sorry the next day, but nevertheless, sometimes your, your, your actions changes your feelings. So, I have a megaphone down here. Shout. Words of worship. Shout it. Words of worship. Be passionate about it. I got something else from my bag. Baby blanket. And a baby blanket symbolizes to me to feel it. The worth from God. Feel the worth, feel it, the worth from God. The baby blanket reminds me and illustrates for me the comfort and worth that we all have in God. And I need a reminder, you may not need one, but I need a reminder of God's love for me almost every day. I, I just do. Some think they don't need to be reminded of God's every day, but I think so. I think I, I know I do. I need to be reminded that God loves me no matter what. With that being said, there's an 80-20 an rule in effect here. Now you can take, you can, you can, uh, I'll entertain after services, I'll entertain an argument over this if you want. But I, I, I still kind of feel it's somewhat true. Out of all the people you know, out of all the people you run in contact, in, you get you're in contact with in a day, I lay you odds that 20 percent, 20 percent you run into, don't care for you at all. They don't like you. 20 percent of the people, not going to like you, for whatever reason. Now, for the 80 percent out there who feel sorry for me. You have 20% of people that don't like you either. You go, well, that, that doesn't sound right. <clears throat> One of the things I learned umpiring, everybody's pretty friendly at the beginning of the game. Half of the people don't like, won't like what I do during the game at any given time. And the people who like what I do, give it an inning, maybe that will change too. Okay? One, being a people pleaser all of my life, being an umpire really helped me understand that the one person who loves me all the time is God. And, the, and, the, and, and you say, I can't believe out of 100 people that I know, 20, 20, 20 of them don't like me. It may be higher. They're just too polite to not to, they're, they're probably just too polite to tell you so. 
But you know who always loves me? God does. God does. God does. Welcome to a fallen world. Welcome to a sinful world. It's called life. The best defense against the reality of the world is to be reminded of my worth that God has for me. The worth he sees in me. The worth he sees in you. Now how can you do that? Well, again, practicality, right? Many of you bathe, right? I'm, I'm hoping many of you bathe. Maybe you take a shower. Whether, you, whether you're a tub person or a shower person, I don't really need, need to know, but... And when I'm in the shower, I can allow that water to flow over me and remind me that God is showering his love and his worth upon me. We just sung this morning about a, a song called Healing Rain. Michael W. Smith wrote it, which addresses the worth that God has for us in his own eyes. The baby blanket reminds me that he wraps me up and he covers me because I'm of worth. He loves me. And I use that time. Use whatever you need to use. Maybe you're slipping into that tub. Understand, as you slip into that tub, you can say, oh, God's love is like this warm bathtub just enveloping me. Whatever triggers that, that, that type of worship in you in the morning or at night. What is the truth of God's love? Well, the truth is that each of us are created in the image of God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. And each of us has a tiny strand of spiritual DNA of the, from the author of the universe himself living within us. Who loved you so much, who loved me so much, that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross to take my place and display for me the love that he has for me. The Bible says in Psalm 121, Praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. Psalm 63, 3, Your unfailing love is better for me than life itself. How I praise you. I can't think of a better way to begin a day than to remind myself of God's unfailing love and worth for me. Can you? Shout it. Words of, words of worship. Feel it. God's worth for us. And I got another one. You know what this is, right? It's a Bible. Hide it. Words from God. Hide it. Words from God. The Bible reminds me that God wants to speak to me. This is where the action, this is the action where I take the Bible and I hide God's word in my heart. Where does this idea of hiding God's word, word come from? It comes from God's word himself. Take a look at Psalms 119.11. For your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do me a favor and circle the word hidden. Circle the word hidden. It's about treasuring. The word there is, is the same word where we get to treasure. Hide it deep within. It's a treasure to be deep within inside you, deep, deep inside of you. And, and Eugene Peterson takes that verse, Psalms 119.11, he says this. I've banked your promises in the vault of my heart. Listen to that. Your word have I hidden. I have banked it in the vault of my heart. So I won't sin myself bankrupt. Ooh. 
Those are powerful words. Your words have I hidden in my heart. I treasure it. I put it in the vault like a bank because I know, I know today when I get up in the morning <coughs> and I have to face my day, I'm going to sin. And I have to have his word. I don't want to be bankrupt because of my sin. The Bible. Oh, it's so old-fashioned. That's so antique. That's so provincial. The Bible is one of the ways God speaks to us in the 21st century, folks. That's how God speaks to us. Your view of the Bible will determine your biblical view of life. In fact, your view of the Bible will determine how you view the Bible in your life. And if you treat the Bible like any other treasured works of literature, the Iliad, Shakespeare, if you cherish it like that, it's not going to be worth much to you. But if the Bible, if the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, inspired by God Himself, It's going to do you a whole lot better than reading the sports page or the newspaper editorial or watching Fox News. You don't like what's going on, pick up God's Word and hide His Word deep in your heart. Your view of the Bible is, if your view of the Bible is the inspired words of God, then what you do with it is of supreme importance. Do I got a few minutes more? Yeah. Why do people have hang-ups about reading the Bible? Why do people have hang-ups about reading the Bible? And the number one reason I have found why people don't read the Bible is time. They don't have enough time and let me tell you, how do I say this nicely? If, you, if your excuse is about time, that's just a plain, lame excuse. I'm sorry. That's just lame. Because what we treasure, we provide time for. You see what I'm saying? What we treasure. Coy and I had an opportunity to go golfing this Thursday, so we took it. Three and a half hours of our time. I'm sad to say I'm not sure I read three and a half hours of God's word that day. And you know, confession's good for the soul, bad for the reputation. I get it. But you're sitting there and you've, you've done some of the same thing, okay? Time is a lame excuse. You see what I'm saying? Well, the second most popular excuse is understanding. I just don't understand everything in the Bible. There are some sections of the Bible that's difficult to understand. No kidding. You know, there's a reason why I have yet to preach in Ezekiel. There's a reason. I'd rather preach through the book of Revelation every day of the week and twice on Sunday if I had to than to deal with Ezekiel. There's just some things I just don't understand. And if I have a hard time understanding it, how am I going to convey that understanding to you? But that is a poor excuse also. This just doesn't hold water. There are many things that we just don't understand, but we use it anyway. See, I don't understand how I get power to my house, but I have no problem turning the light switch on. We get frustrated when our cable goes out. Because we can't fix that. Somebody else has to fix it for us. But we're so quick in turning the remote on to watch it. I don't know how it works. I don't understand it. Gina and I went to Denver <coughs> the, the first week of June for a wedding. I got in on an airplane. An aluminum tube and with some carbon fiber, lots of wires, big engines, we got on this plane, and we trusted a stranger that we did not know. Now, John is retired, so I can't 
fly with John, I know John, to take me about 29,000, 31,000 feet in the air and land me safely in Denver in an hour and a half. I don't know how it works. Do you? But we do it anyway. We do it anyway. Oh, you can tell me, and I know the aerodynamics, I get it. I, I understand that part. You don't want me piloting it, though. Nope. Folks, you don't have to understand things, everything in God's Word. He'll explain it to you. Right? Say yes. yes. Thank you. Oh, but wait a minute. It's overwhelming. I, it's, it's so big, so overwhelming. Starting in January, we haven't done, we do this about every other year. Starting in January, we're going to put a, a reading guide so you can read the Bible in chronological order for the entire year. So I'm going to get up, we're going to be all excited. You, you're, each week you're going to be getting this thing. This little reading list, in case you don't have it, you're going to have it there for you. If you can't find one, um, we'll provide one. And I'm going to be encouraging you to read your Bibles all the way through. And about March, you're going to start feeling guilty because I keep hammering you to read your Bible. And by June, you have so far behind that you decide you're going to give up anyway. But I, you still have the guilt because I keep shaming you to keep doing it. Right? The reality is this. Nationwide... Pastors who encourage their, their, their people to read the Bible through in one year have a success rate of 1%. 1%. Listen. When we start this program in January and we come to June and you feel like you're so far behind that you can't catch up, don't catch up. Just start again right where you're at in June. See what I'm saying? There... How many of you read Hamilton? Anybody in here read Hamilton? 700 pages. I have yet to make it out of the first chapter. I have had it for... I've had it for I don't know how, how many... Since we, went, since we went to Israel five years ago. Couldn't get out of the first chapter. That's okay. Every time I pick it up, I read another paragraph and I put it down. <laughs> Sooner or later, I'm going to get through all 700 pages. But understand, you don't need to feel guilty. Let me give you some hope to help you relieve some of your guilt in this area. I can't find anywhere in Scripture about how much you should read and how much time you should be spending reading it. I, I can't find that in Scripture. Oh, it says meditate day and night upon it. But I can't find any place that says you've got to read it from cover to cover and how long it should take you to do it. My encouragement is to begin to read for depth, not for distance. Read for depth, not for distance. Instead, place emphasis on consistency, not the length of time. For me, that has been a lifesaver, literally a lifesaver. When I all, all of a sudden I realize I need to be consistent with my Bible reading, not so much with my time, I pick it up easier. By the way, I'm going to give you permission I'm going to give you permission to do this. Now, you're, if guys, your wife may not like this, and some of you might take exception, but I'm going to give you permission to do this. It's okay to have a Bible in the bathroom. It's okay to have a Bible to read when you're in the bathroom. It's okay. I, 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 I wouldn't shame you otherwise. It sure, beats, it sure beats playing solitaire, that's for sure. You laugh, but some of you do it, I know. Right? Or Tetra, or whatever it is you do. I don't need to know. Too much information. 
consistently. In fact, let me give you some hints. You know Proverbs has 31 chapters in Proverbs. You know it takes about two minutes to read through a chapter? Why don't you just take one chapter? What, did, what is today, 10th? Why don't you start today on Proverbs 10? How many days are in July? 30? 31 days in July? Well, there you go. Start today at Proverbs 10 and go through Proverbs 31. And then when August comes, start with Proverbs 1. A chapter a day. How easy is that? There's also a book called The One Minute Bible. I know nothing about The One Minute Bible. But if it gets you in God's Word, so be it. On my tablet, I have the verse for today. Trust me, I don't read just one verse. I start there and I go through. You know, every day, I'm in God's Word. Then I have my three-year-old knocking on the bathroom door. We had Thursday. Friday morning, she's knocking. Papa, what are you doing? I'm going potty. Can I come in? No. But wouldn't that be better, reading God's Word, than playing any game, or reading a novel, or whatever? Can you really have a quiet time in your bathroom? I think you can. Aristotle, who's not a godly person, said, living a virtuous life is a series of habitual choices. Living a godly life is a series of tiny choices that you and I make every day that shapes the type of Christian we are and we want to become. It's okay to put Bibles everywhere throughout the house, wherever you might be. Like Gideon Bibles in a hotel. The first thing I do when I go to the hotel, I have to look for that Gideon Bible, Bob. I look for that, you know. It's okay to have Bibles all over the house to remind you that you need to be reading it. You got some cheap Bibles out there. In fact, my tablet has all kinds of tra different translations. Your phone can, you can download the U, U Bible just really easily and, and then you can read to your heart's content. God's Word. Psalms 119, 135, those who love your teachings will find true peace and nothing will defeat them. In, in Psalms 119, 119 105, your, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I got one more. I got one more. I got one more cup. It's a cup. Not only do I need to hide God's word, not only do I need to be feeling God's worth and shouting worship, I need to say it. Words to God. The coffee cup there reminds us to illustrate spending time in prayer with God. Words to God in prayer. In the morning, I need to take time to focus on, connection, connecting, uh, in a, on a connection with God. By the way, don't get hung up on the amount of time you need to pray. Listen to me. Don't get hung up on the time, uh, on how much time you should spend in prayer. It always bothered me because Martin Luther, was it Martin Luther? I want to make sure I... Martin Luther would spend three hours in prayer before he started his, his prayer, uh, before he started his day in the morning. And I'm going, I don't know how I could do that. Trust me, he didn't start with three hours of prayer. He started little at a time. To finally, he says... I've got so much, t I have so much to do today, I have to spend time in prayer with God to get it done. That's his, that's, that was his, his take on it. Notice Jesus taught us in a model prayer. Gave us a model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's a model prayer. How long does it take you to recite that model prayer? 20 seconds? 
30 seconds, if you slow it down, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it... How long does it take you to do that? Recite that. See, it's not, the, it's not long prayers. It's deep prayer. The highlight of prayer is the power of connecting with God. See, the key is connecting with God. Sometimes you get, we get together with one another, right? Hey, let's go have a cup of coffee. What are we doing? We are connecting. We're talking. We're having a conversation over that cup of coffee, that cup of tea, that cup of milk. For years, I just, wrote, I just kind of wrote this testimony down because I didn't want to overlook anything. For years, I knew a lot about prayer than I ever experienced. I'd been a Christian since I was nine. I have a good education. I even went to seminary. I knew and I know a lot about prayer. Ask my wife. But I didn't always experience all that much with consistency. Instead, I felt guilty most of the time. Anybody with me? Can anybody testify to that? I felt guilty that I wasn't one of those prayer warriors. I felt guilty that in my house I didn't have a prayer closet. I felt guilty when I read about Martin Luther who got up early in the morning to pray for three hours before he started his day. That wasn't me. Then I realized that prayer wasn't about making me feel guilty. It was about me connecting with God. When I discovered that, it changed my life. It began to change my relationship with God. I experienced a depth in my relationship with God that I had never had before. And now I pray. It's more out of hunger for God, to be with God, and less out of guilt. I have learned in my own weird, warped way to pray consistently. To pray consistently without ceasing. Sometimes if you see me driving in the car, you'll be seeing me, my lips are moving along. Trust me, I'm not singing about the song. I'm not singing a song on the radio. Well, I could be singing a song on the radio. Chances are I'm having a conversation with God. When I was in a bad place in my life, I'd have to take the kids to school. It was a 30-minute drive, then a 30-minute drive to get to my office. On that drive, after I dropped them off to my office and the drive picking them up, me and God spent a lot of time in conversation in the car. I didn't close my, I didn't bow my head, I didn't close my eyes, but just as if he was there in the car with me, we had the conversation. And I know that some people past me thought I was really strange but I've learned in my own warped way to try to connect with God in prayer we can have all kinds of lessons on prayer but you know the biggest thing about prayer is just doing it conversing we talked about this not too long ago I don't speak in old English when I pray I don't use these and thous. I use my plain makeup word English. I barely speak English. Some think it's I speak in tongues and it's no it's English, it's just can't get it out. There's some words that just I just can't get out sometimes. It's right there in my head, it's right on the tip of my tongue, but it won't roll off. God doesn't care. He doesn't make fun of me that I say tiger instead of tiger or wash instead of wash. Everybody else, my wife does. God doesn't. He says, that's okay, I'll wash you clean anyway. You see where I'm going with this, folks? I don't know where I'm at. 
But it's God's desire to hear from your heart and connect with him. In, Rome, in, in Matthew 7, 9 through 11, your parents, Jesus says, if, if your kids ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're sinful, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Skeptics say that answer, answered prayers are only coincidences. But I'm amazed in my life how many coincidences have come my way when I begin to pray. You know, the story is, boy, you're the luckiest man I know. And the guy goes, yeah, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. The more I pray, the more coincidences I have in my life. Isn't that interesting? Oh, do you believe in coincidence? I don't. I think God's hands of providence is there. But other people see it as coincidence. And you know something? The more I pray, the more God answers my prayers. Or I see, I, The more I see God, I shouldn't say answers my prayers. Sometimes I ask for things I shouldn't be asking for. And God makes sure I don't get them. But I get this connection with God. Because He's my Heavenly Father who wants to hear from me, who wants to talk to me, who wants to show me his worth so I can worship and shout his praise with passion. Do you think this is a doable thing in your life? Whether you're a morning person or a night person makes no difference. Do you think this is a doable thing in your life? Shout it. Feel it. Hide it and speak it. I think that's all doable. That's a, and I don't care how busy you are. You can make time for this. Psalms 1 verses 1 through 3 says this, Oh, the joys who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on, on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruits each season. Their leaves never, never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Will you feel the gentle tug in your heart and hear that small whisper God is whispering to you this morning? One last thing. It's time. And you look at your watch. Sure, you're past time. No, no. It's time. It's time to stop feeling guilty. It's time. It's time to, to get started. Put the excuses away and start doing the doable things. Can you do that? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, you know our hearts. And I'm speaking generally, Father, for everybody here, but I want to connect with you, and I hope others want to connect with you also. So many of us simply walk past you in the morning with all the best intentions to reconnect later, but we never do. So, Father, Help us. We're tired of living disconnected lives. So I ask, would you please help us create these habits so that we can begin every day with the recognition of your presence and to live an adventure with you and for you. We ask your help in this. And we ask Jesus' help and pray these things in his name. Amen. You can make a di God wants to make a difference in your life, and you can make a difference in the world. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I invite you to come and know to come and know Him. You say, "I don't know how to, what you do." You don't need to know. You just need to come. Some of us be up the front. I'll come up front if I need to. We have John Gregory, and we have Bob who can come up to the front. But come, come. 
the altar's open. Maybe you just need to get before God and say, hey, I want to stop feeling guilty. Let me start right where I am right now. One general was fighting a, a battle. Their lines were torn. They didn't know. He, everybody was wondering what we're going to do. It, it, it's, it's kind of like, I think it was in Normandy. And I don't know if it was, you know, I don't know if it was a movie I saw this in, but it rings true. Don't know where we're at. Don't know if we're on the right beach. But the battle starts right now, right here. So let us start. Let's all stand as we sing this song of commitment, song of invitation. You come as we sing. <laughs>